Um, well, we're here today to talk about um, um, a really important um, subject, and, and it's about how, how we make this transition to net zero. But in particular, we're looking at, you know, in some ways, a rather amazing kind of um, first step at doing this in a kind of real world experiment, a piece of work that's been done with um, um, Glatness School. Um, so what we have today is we've got a couple of presenters online. Uh, we've got Professor Susan Krumdiek, who's going to talk about and um, give the background to this uh, concept of transition engineering. Susan wanted to be here very much today. Um, she's actually in, uh, in Kerbister, not at the moment, because she broke her leg um, about a week ago and is uh, seriously sort of um, incapacitated when it comes to moving around. Um, but I'm delighted that she's managed to make it online. Um, our second speaker, uh, Florian Aris, is, he's a, a PhD student here who's been working um, with Glatner School on this project. I'll say a tiny bit uh, about it in a moment or two. And he's in Berlin, so he's going to be doing some of the presentation um, from there. And I've got um, Kate Tizey with us here, who's principal teacher curriculum at Glatner, who was really kind of at the core face with the kids. And, um, um, and initiated this sort of um, project in many ways. So I'll let the speakers talk about the detail about the project, but just in short, by way of an introduction, it's really looking at what we call the school run, getting kids to school. And, you know, it's, uh, and how can we kind of decarbonize that activity and, and sort of make it uh, towards net zero. Now, you might be sitting there saying, thinking, I come along to meetings about big pieces of kit and equipment, and, you know, we learn about the kind of excitement of, you know, hydrogen and exporting the energy um, out, of, out of Orkney to the challenges of the grid and so on. And we've had a lot of presentations like that. And technically, they're sort of super exciting and, and challenging to do. But the journey to net zero is actually going to involve us making lifestyle changes. It's not about a technical solution as partly technical solutions. And Orkney's fantastic at exploring these technical solutions and doing some, uh, you know, trial and pieces of equipment and so on. And we're, we're a net exporter of renewable energy. But we are also, we are actually going to have to make kind of life, lifestyle changes. So part of the research that we need to do is about uh, um, real world research about, you know, how do we actually decarbonize um, our, our, our own lives. And this project, what I want to say at the start, it, you know, it, it wouldn't have happened without Greatness School and Greatness School actually approaching Harriet Watt and actually the kids, the kids at Greatness School saying, we want to do something about net, net zero. And Kate had uh, listening to that, responding to that, approaching Harriet Watt to, you know, ask about that. And, and that is truly remarkable, and it's actually a testament to Orkney at its best in actually trying to do something. I'm a, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Sandy Kern. I'm a director of ICIT, and you know I do academic research. This is what academics are supposed to do. It's not part of our day job. Sorry, it is part of our day job, but most certainly is not part of the day job of a teacher or a primary school. So it's it's remarkable um, that, that that happened. And before I pass over to speakers, just to, I just wanted to, something struck me today. I, I nipped home um, for a, a bite of tea before I came back out and I, I flipped the television on and there was the really quite um, scary sort of news item about last year has been the hottest year on record. Um, we were 1.5 degrees above the average uh, temperature sort of globally, quite, you know, sort of stark. And then there was a commercial break and during that commercial break, it's two e book your holidays, fly off to the sort of Mediterranean or whatever. And you know, we're not making that that connection that actually, as I say, this is not a you know, there's not a technical fix to this. It's about sort of lifestyles. And that those two sort of the news item and that advert ju juxtaposition are, you know, really kind of remarkable. And this project in a small way 
is actually sort of challenging that and thinking about how people sort of organise themselves differently. Now, I need to shut up quickly because I'm in danger of rabbiting on and we've got some speakers and we're, we're quite delayed already. So what we're going to do is we're going to hand over to Susan. I think when Susan starts talking, the camera will flip over to her, I presume, who's going to give a presentation, a kind of overview of uh, transition engineering. Maybe we've got some slides. Uh, then we'll pass over to Florian, who is involved in organising the project. And then Kate's going to give us some of the kind of school's perspective um, of this project. And then we can have some questions. So without further ado, we'll um, um, pop over to um, Susan. The question is, um, how do we find our way? And being that we're in Orkney, let's think about that in terms of our famous explorer, John Ray, that you might know where you want to go, but you don't have a map, um, don't, have a, don't have a route map. Um, you know the kinds of tools you're going to need, but you, need, you know you need to tool up and you're going to have to think as you go. And so this is the sort of space that we're in when it comes to finding our way to net zero, is that we don't really know. Now, first thing is we do need to understand the challenge. This is what some of the people who tried to find the Northwest Passage and were not successful did, was that they didn't really appreciate the challenge. They reckoned they could do it because they have a stiff upper lip or something, and that's not a good plan. So let's really take a moment just to get into the challenge. What is the problem? Well, the problem is unsustainable growth. Doing unsustainable things is not necessarily the problem. It's that you're doing more and more unsustainable things and growing the amount of those unsustainable and more unsustainable things that you're doing. So it's this sort of growth from a low risk um, activity system, like we might have had here for the past 8,000 years in Orkney, um, where the risks that we do pose when we when we um, do things are mitigated by the ability of nature to bounce back from what we do. Um, but the, the more we grow and the faster we grow, the more we overwhelm nature's ability to keep up with us. And so we push into higher and higher risk. And as we get the ability to look forward, then we start to see that we are heading for failure risk. We're, we're heading to failure limits where bad things start to happen, where there's tipping points, where the ocean gets too acidified, it gets too hot. These sort of um, you know, failure limits that people keep talking about. Well, actually maybe they use the word target, but I think that's a bad thing to call a failure is, is a target. So we aren't, we aren't gonna do that. And so if we look at this um, from the question of, okay, what are we going to do now? We can try and get growing again after we have a, a COVID dip or, or some other little bounce in our economy. And we can try to get growing again, business as usual growth. And that will push us right past the failure limits to where we're committed to failure. It's not just a probability anymore. And even into what's not possible to do, and that's where we hit resource depletion and breakdown. So that's not great. We definitely want to look for new technologies, and, and we do. We look for things that, that are more sustainable. But if you have a more sustainable, unsustainable growth, then you buy yourself a bit of time, but you still hit those failure limits. So that's not um, going to uh, fix everything. Efficiency. Okay, we need to be more efficient about what we do. Absolutely true. Again, doesn't change if we don't change the underlying growth of what's unsustainable. Unsustainable. Well, if people just consumed differently, if we changed our lifestyles, yes, that would make a big difference, but it doesn't, it doesn't stop us from growing past the limits. So if we put all those together, maybe we could get to no growth. And this is a thing that we're starting to hear a bit that that we can't grow our emissions anymore. We have to stop growing our emissions. Well, this is true, but in fact, if you look at the actual science, you see that um, the rapid decline, there's a there's an forward operating environment that gets us back to a safe zone, to being able to manage the risks and to mitigate the risks. And so that sort of idea, we've seen that in IPCC um, uh, projections and modeling that this is what we must do. We, we, we have to follow this pathway. Okay, 
Um, how do we do that? And that's that's the challenge that we're talking about. What I know is that if you take an existing incumbent system and you try to squeeze changes out of it, you end up doing that a little bit more sustainable, unsustainable thing. And you, you sort of keep tracking um, in the direction you were going. So what transition engineering is, what we're looking for is a way to map out, navigate and explore transition pathways. And that's where we shift through a purposeful shift to downshift what's unsustainable and build up what's resilient and what um, is actually survivable and thrivable. And that discipline of doing that work is called transition engineering. It is a relatively new field in that um, Harriet Watt is the first university to really take on um, that as a research and teaching um, uh, enterprise. But everything starts somewhere. And um, like other fields before, um, this is where it starts. And Harriet Wall is proud to be the place where transition engineering starts. It's a, it's a place where um, studying to make machines and, and drive the Industrial Revolution started, where oil and gas research and teaching um, took off. And uh, we also launched banking and finance. Um, so yes, we would like to um, be part of the action. The Island Center for Net Zero is what drew me here from the 20 years of research I spent with um, 20 some PhD students, a number of colleagues really asking that question, how do we find our way and pulling together these elements of transition engineering, the principles and the, fa and the fundamentals and the, um, the methods. And so I came here to um, be part of, well, be the research director for Island Center for Net Zero. And that is a open structure where we work with people on helping them, doing the engineering for them to change what they need to change. What that looks like in practice, we are now up and running after several years of work of putting together the center is for uh, the, the entry is the transition lab. And this means we have a research team, we have project management, and we have funding to work with people who organizations and stakeholders who are under pressure for change. And this, it, 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 when you're under pressure for change and you don't know what you should do next, you don't know, you know, what's the next path. Maybe there's even a lot of noise about what you should do next, but you aren't sure how that would work. That's where the solutions aren't known. So we, we stop talking about solutions and we now focus in on diagnosing the actual problem. And we do that, when we do that, what we see is that the pressures that people are under to a large extent, when the problem is the overshooting of benefits and costs and unsustainable uh, activities just growing too much, you now add on top of that decarbonization um, and trying to deal with how are we gonna deal with climate change that we've already caused, you get what's called wicked problems. The incumbent systems that we have um, are the way they are because they work great because they're legal, because they meet standards, because the regulations enforce them, because the policies support them, and because we all understand them. That's why we're doing what we're doing, and that has to change, and that's wicked. So <laughs> just to know that. All right, we need to use data. We need to use modeling. We need to um, use every bit of digital capital that we can create to address the underlying issue in this wicked problem. And we do that using the transition engineering in time design. Um, that stands for interdisciplinary transition, innovation, management, and engineering. And I will explain that quickly in the case of the um, school run. We have to use modeling and we have to use observatory. That's, you know, the, the modeling that we can, when we look at it, we can all understand it. And out of that, then we get insights and innovations of the way that we can go forward. And when we go forward, it looks like we're going to achieve those shifts. The sustainability is, the unsustainability is going to be downshifted. All right. So I moved here, I was setting all this up and um, had a little spot on the radio with Rob Flett. And um, I got this letter or this, this packet of letters in the mail and they were from um, 
a class at Gleitness and they did a lovely job. They had lovely penmanship. They'd set out their letters very nicely and um, uh, broke my heart. They were asking for help. <laughs> they were asking for help um, to be able to address climate change to, to you know, okay. <laughs> so I thought about that, okay. Um, can we can we help them? Can we work with them? And I, I didn't really know, but then I got some students on board and I said, let's do this. So we used the methods that we um, that I've just told you about, and I want to run through those with you as a way of showing you how it works. So this is transition engineering in action. Do we have a wicked problem? Well, to have a wicked problem, you have to have an essential activity that you're trying to achieve. It is essential that children get to school safely. No question about that. The way that we're doing it now, which is that all, all of the parents, every household can load the kids into a car, drive them to the school and drop them off. That is 100% um, true. You can do that. And that, that will work every time. It works great in a fossil fueled car. There's no limit to that. That's what we're doing now. And that's what has to change. Why does it have to change? Because it's not sustainable. Um, fossil fuel has to downshift by 80% to turn the corner on climate change. So that's, that's what the science says. Um, it satisfies the needs for parents and caregivers to get those kids to school safely. No question about it, you, it will work. Um, but it causes problems. If you Google school run congestion, it is a problem in every town, in every city, in every corner of the planet, um, the school drop off with cars. It causes terrible ground level air pollution. Um, the, the children lose that time of, of being able to exercise. They spend a lot of time sitting in the car and um, the land use that's required for that is, is very wasteful, et cetera. Um, we want green solutions, of course we do, which means we're looking at electric cars or hydrogen or biofuels or something that, that is green, yes? But that isn't going to happen. There isn't the money to change things. People don't want to change. People don't want to be shamed into changing. People don't want the government to tell them they have to change. Teachers don't want angry parents. The council doesn't want angry parents. Nobody wants angry people. And so we'll just let it go for another year, right? That's a wicked problem. Um, well, we now have a wicked problem. And at the heart of that is that we're trying to achieve a good thing. And because we're all doing that, we're creating a bad thing. So it's a collective behavior that reinforces the behavior itself. It's, it's called a positive feedback loop. So the only way to break that is by a new rule that resets the system so that you achieve the um, essential activity, which is safe transport to school without the collective forcing you to do it in a particular way. And I don't know if you think about it that way, but the reason you wouldn't drop your kid off uh, or you wouldn't stop dropping your kid off is because then your kid would be the one not in a car when everybody else is. And it's, you, you can't picture that, that doesn't sound good. All right, so we do this in time design sprint. There's seven steps. They, uh, this is done in the transition engineering um, team and I'm gonna walk you through what, what we did there. The first step, that's uh, it, it, we're not in a good place. It's hard to change. There's, there's nothing that we know what to do about it. We do research into what's been done before and we see that that you know, for 30 years, this has been a problem and, and it hasn't been solved. So it doesn't, it sounds pretty hard. So what we do in the first step is we take a time travel. <laughs> we, we go back to 1911 in the place where we're looking. So um, Gleitness School wasn't there in 1911, but there was Kirkwall Grammar in 1911. And what we know about Orkney in 1911 after visiting the friendly people at the archives in the library and the um, History Museum is that there was indeed a car in Orkney in 1911 and the, the young boys loved to race it because they could run faster than the car could go. Um, and of course there was a school and all of the children walked to school in Kirkwall. Um, all of the people in Kirkwall walked to work. 
and all of the people in Kirkwall walked to the shops. So that's how it was. Um, as things changed with time, by the 1970s, a new school was built and the council took over the school um, building. And that new school is already gone. It didn't, it wasn't great. It didn't last very long. Um, but you started to get by about 2000, you started to get the drop off. And once you got a critical mass of drop off, then again, everywhere around the world, you went from a few people dropping off and a few more and a few more, and then boom, everyone's dropping off. Um, so this has been this um, well-known problem for a long time. All right, step two is that we gather all the data that we can about the way things are today. What's going on at the school? Where is it? Get the geospatial data, um, get the, the car trips, the data that exists from the hands up survey that's been done at the school. And we, we see that there's special needs people, kids at the school who, who really do need um, mobility um, assistance. They need to be um, taken. And there are some older grades that, that they most of the children do walk. And of course, the younger ones, uh, most of them don't. So we just get all the data. And then the next step is to say, OK, well, what are the solutions that people are thinking about? And we purposefully crash test them. If they are good solutions, we run the numbers and then we can chase that down. But if they don't quite fit, we need to know that because we need to move on. Um, you cannot innovate if you already have a solution. So. Uh, if there isn't a solution, then we innovate. So of course, electric cars, that's what everybody's there is thinking, electric cars, electric cars. And that's true. They're about half the price per um, per mile as, as your petrol car. It would only take five or seven, five kilowatt wind turbines to charge up the cars that um, would be used to get to Gleitness School. Um, the cost is coming down. They're anywhere between 18 to 27,000 for an EV. Um, the replacement of the cars, however, goes at a steady pace, according to old cars needing to be replaced, and that would take about till 2040, so um, too late for our downshift that we need. Um, we had some fun looking at biofuels. Um, a lot of biofuels are made from food materials, and so for fun, look at what it, uh, we could if we took 30% of Orkney's whiskey production and distilled it down to get the ethanol out. Um, it would take 2.3 million pounds worth of whiskey to get the children of lightness to school using biofuel. <laughs> okay, this is where you say, okay, that probably won't happen. <laughs> um, or 30% of the current oats crop could be made into ethanol. Again, what is that oats crop worth? Who does it feed? Where does it go? And there aren't um, ethanol 80% vehicles available in the UK at this time. So that might not be a solution. Um, how about hydrogen? We love to talk about our hydrogen. Well, it would take 35 five kilowatt wind turbines, so five times what, what the straight electricity and battery would take. Um, the Mirai and the Nexo are um, three times more expensive than the um, than the electric vehicles and the plant, the, the cost of the plant to do the hydrogen generation, store it, uh, dispense it, um, the, yeah, that, that gets to be a blowout, um, in price and it's still years away. So that we are going to park that it did not satisfy our crash test, um, park that by the side of the road and move on. The next step is to go 100 years in the future and see what's going on there. We know that in 100 years from now, the petrol car is done for, for private transport. There's probably still some, some mineral diesel that is in the market for emergencies, um, maybe for, um, for some important end uses. Um, but it, it's not how people move around through their um, environment, through their urban environment. Um, but what we do see is that uh, Gleitness School is there, the town of Kirkwall is there, and people are having a good time. And what we see is that children do indeed get to school um, in a school run, an actual run. They are free to, to do that. There's no danger to them of being run over by, by vehicles because the urban form is for people. And that's that's interesting. Um, now it's time to come back. So we, we back cast, we come back and we say, okay, what do they have 100 years from now that we don't have? And what they have 
the, an actual valuable thing is that their children have freedom. Their children have freedom to move through their city streets without danger of cars. Um, their kids are free from that pollution. And the trigger that we need to find now is what happens now that starts to create that reality for those, um, for our children. And that would be to facilitate the kids to learn how to engineer their own and their school's transition to achieve carbon-free school runs. We need to help the kids figure out how to do that. Uh, I don't know if you've been in this space at all around um, trying to get people to uh, change their behavior around schools, but we can't find an instance where that is what people did, where they, they tried to facilitate the children actually exploring and figuring it out. So we need a concept design. What would this look like if that was to happen? Um, so we think through a process that the students will go through where they will become inventors, they will use data, they will become explorers, they'll understand that, um, and they'll become transitioning kids. Uh, there's some activities that they need to do, the teachers need to teach them, the parents need to understand that, the whole school community needs to understand it, and then there'll be tools that'll be needed. So uh, the, the, um, the achievement is 20% of the trips are by car. That's the net zero um, shift that downshifts the unsustainable to um, what we can manage the risks of. So there we take off. And then now that we think we have a, a framework with, that we can work with, we have a, a concept that, um, that we can work with, always a good idea to check, sense check. Is this reducing the risk that we set out to, to, to reduce? Is this building up the things that we value, social values, health values, resilience values, community values? It, what will happen if this is successful going forward? What will happen? The children would learn. And the children would learn to start whatever they're doing by learning the science and using math around a factual basis. The children would learn to formulate a problem, define a problem. The children would learn to explore and find their way. They would learn to share and help each other. They would learn to make rules that help everyone and that are fair. The children would learn to gather data, to track progress with graphs and other um, visuals. They would learn to communicate their needs to the community and they would learn to celebrate success. And when they do that, they can teach the rest of us. All right, I'm now gonna turn over to Florian to talk about his experience um, working with Kate and the children in co-design and running of the school run. Right, thank you, Susan. I hope you can uh, hear me well in Orkney. We should, I can hear you. Okay, that's good, I guess, yeah. All right, well, um, right, let, me let me tell you something about the actual program of work that that has been developed there and we've got to remember two things there just one that we figured that an actual innovation in the space would be to give the students and the school something that they can do about their own problems that they have and um, the second one being that that our mission here is the goal is to actually downshift the fossil fuel that's that's in the score and so, so keeping these two things in mind we co-designed a four-stage program of work together with the, with the school. And these first stages are all about the, the challenge, the mission, and, and how to do the, the transition. We've got um, teacher resources for actual teaching activities. We've got uh, learning programs for the students themselves to actually do the work that is required to, to transition. And we also have the, the digital data tools to allow the, the whole community, the, the parents, and, and the wider school community, obviously, to, to communicate within this process as well. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so as I said, um, stage one first work program is to explore the challenges. And one thing that we learned quite early on in um, discussing with Kate is that the current way of teaching climate change and sustainability is probably not working because it's very depressing for everyone. It's depressing for the students. It's depressing for the teachers because 
it's mostly about harms and um, the sea level rise and birds dying and all all the bad things and that's obviously not that's not good um so what we did is in the first stage we flipped our perspective and we said that we obviously still need to learn about global warming and climate change and all of that but we take a place-based approach to this and uh, we learn about how our activities at the school contribute to this to give us an action to tell us what we can do about it and in this we learned about school transport and um, fossil fuels and cars and, and how all of that works and there was, it was actually really really interesting to have primary school kids talking about fossil fuels natural gas and internal combustion engines and that, that was really cool and in this we also needed to talk about since we talk about the activity here, which is school transport, we also need to talk about the, the, the history, how, how the parents and the grandparents got to school back in the day, because obviously there, there were less, less cars, if at all, any car available, and they still all somehow got to school. So, that, so that's really interesting. All of that was um, accompanied by a, a co-designed storybook, the, the Stories for Change, that takes a, a narrative perspective to to changing things and and to transitioning and to also actually achieving these changes and and that storybook was was designed for for the whole family basically and uh, within within this 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 first program uh, of work we also had the net zero heroes forming forming up and uh, if you wonder what this is, what this is this is basically a a, a self organization that that came from the school because there were couple of really invested students who who formed the Net Zero Hero Committee. And that's basically a group of students from each class that got nominated within a class. And um, they basically helped us, the researchers and the teachers, in uh, communicating the program and communicating with the parents. And um, basically, basically, we had the students carrying out the project from, from the stage. And so that was really good. Next slide, please. Now that we learned about the challenge, we we need to to um, to, to know the data, <laughs> to know the mission. What is the mission? And in that, we we took a very say physical approach by going into the classes with some physical maps of Kirkwall, and we we uh, basically taught the students some some geospatial thinking there. That was really interesting. We located the, the school on the map. We located the the landmarks of Kirkwall, and we we also located the Individual, individual houses, of course, and then we took some some pipe cleaners, as you can see on the on the bottom picture here, to draw the the transport web to school, and we use different colors for the different modes of of transport there. And now I can tell you that I would have loved to to bring some pictures of all the workshops that we did with the kids messing around with some pipe cleaners and so on. But um, as you all know, there's some some laws about around that that I that, that we can't really show pictures of kids here. So bear with me here, please. Um, anyway, what, what came out of this is that we really understood the mission as in that we now were able to see physically with colors and everything that, that there is a mission that we need to downshift our, our fossil our remaining fossil fuel school transport that we have. And uh, what also came out of that is that the, the students were able to, to do some, some pretty advanced maths actually to do to calculate some, some some shares and so on. Um, next slide, please. So having established the uh, the challenge and the mission, we we took a step back and thought there's usually still something missing in these transition processes, and that's about the the bottom up aspect of actually making your own rules about about this transition that affects your personal life so much. This is why we we came up with the the goodie game. <laughs> um, again, I would love to to show you some pictures here because there were sweets involved, and and obviously students the, the, they love the sweets. But what this really is about is to to learn about necessity and convenience and and how they how they basically work together and and how you can negotiate between these two things. And it's also about economics and sharing. And why is that? We've, well, we figured that in the transition process, obviously, we, we will always have students and, and uh, certain people of the community who, who need a ride, who need, well, one way of, 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 of a ride or, or another. 
maybe because they're um, they have a special need, for example. Remember, Gleitness is a is, a, is an all inclusive school, or maybe a teacher has a broken leg, just like Susan at the moment. So obviously, they can't walk or cycle, and they need to get a ride. And what this game was about is to 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 discover these kind of sharing activities, and to most importantly teach the students or make the students learn something about how they can decide about the rules for their games, right? Because essentially, as we said, it's it's a mission for the students to take on. And if we show them how they can discuss and negotiate their own rules, that, that's really great. And the outcome of this is basically <clears throat> that that we achieved um, the students to, to talk about and to basically define rules that don't let anyone behind. There was there was really interesting because there's there's still some some faith in humanity if you, if you play this game with kids. That was really great. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so having having established again um, coming back to the main theme here, having established the the challenge and and the mission and and how to how to actually negotiate and navigate this transition, we see that that we had a, a really great um, initiative within the school that wasn't really planned to be honest with the net zero heroes who communicate and, and facilitate the transition here we had some really good reception in the public uh, we were on, on the radio and and in the newspapers and if, if i if i say we it's basically the kids that that were on the radio and in the newspapers that was really cool the school um was actually able to to close the car park and the the students were able to go out in the car park with some some chalk and paint and basically redecorate the car park with things they would like to have there instead of tarmac and concrete. And uh, as you can imagine, lots of creative things came out there from swimming pools to zoos and, and all these crazy things that would probably look better than a car park. Anyway, what, what the bottom line of this is, is that, that we see that students now know about the challenge while after, after going through, through this work, program of work, they understand data, that they know what the school transport is about. They, they can do some basic maths. They know what, what the challenge and the mission is basically. Um, they know how to make rules for being fair and just with each other. That's really, that's really important generally, I guess. And they have a way to communicate their needs that they now established in, in the first three, three stages, basically. And that's it from my side. And um, over to you, Susan. Thanks. Right. So providing the facility to become problem solvers. Uh, I just wanted to return to the overall transition lab because uh, this has been our pilot project, our, our sort of first out off the rack project, and it has aligned with Florian's um, PhD project, which is to take the in-time design approach that we've got, their in-time design process, and the wicked problem analysis and to fit that into an overall workflow um, of, a, of an approach that we can use again starting with pressures uh, for change and working through to um, changes, uh, actual changes uh, analyzed and verified. So the, the process that the school run has gone through is the discovery stage. So we had the stakeholders um, come in and, and, and talk about um, what they saw as their problems. We did the wicked problem analysis. We started putting together the ways that the, the data that the, the stakeholders need, the data that we need to do calculations and modeling. Then we did our in-time design sprint. Um, then we did some modeling that um, informed that. And then we actually did at the Orkney um, International Island, uh, Orkney International Science Festival, we held a um, jury where we presented the concept for the school run and we got um, the, the go ahead from the jury that that sounded like a legitimate thing to do. And so then the shift project prototype was run. We had the co-design and, and development. Um, we worked on how do we understand um, what's happening? How do we understand the stories? So they created a storybook and the, the kids did some great artwork to, to illustrate their exploration of this space going all the way from the past to the future. Um, and 
The results of this development stage will be um, put to a stakeholder jury. The, it, in a certain way, it has already. It's It's been through some um, discussions and reviews and, and things like that, but we'll hold a formal one before we go to the demonstration phase where we want to develop the product. And that product will then um, be um, used by other teachers and other schools, and we will watch that. And we will also build the data platform, um, this data exchange modeling and observatory platform that can be used by those schools. Oh, sorry. And um, that will require new things in the, um, in the community. And so we will uh, look at how that affects regulations, maybe go to the uh, education first minister and um, explain the, the product and hopefully take it to the accelerator where, where it takes off and becomes the way that this, the school children in, in Scotland and then the UK actually learn about um, transitioning, transitioning. <laughs> All right. So we wanna now um, go over to Kate and give her a chance to give her perspective on this whole process. Um, and uh, that's over to you then. Um, right, okay, so we started it. So the reason that we got involved, first of all, there was an intrinsic motivation from the children themselves. Um, the children are very aware of climate change. If you watch News Round, which many classes do, you're very aware of climate change. It's incredibly stressful, actually, for children to be engaging with topics because they feel very passionately about it. They understand it and there is a lot to understand and generally it's quite hard to engage with in, in, within a positive framework. So some of the other motivations that we have uh, for it are the global goals. Okay, so those are things that um, the global goals are relevant to schools. Um, Education Scotland are looking for schools to um, be aware of and reference them within lessons. Can you go to the next slide? What have we got? Okay, UNCR. Um, all of the schools in Scotland are engaged with rights respecting schools, which is a whole school approach to engaging with uh, the UNCR uh, uh, Convention for uh, Children's Rights. Next slide, please. Right, this is one of the other things. There is a connection with curriculum now. Um, sometimes I think people, are, sometimes children are absolutely astonished as to why we teach the things that we teach. I think they think people think that teachers or schools just wake up and say, we would love to do a project about shoes or um, long division or something like that. But there's a national curriculum. Um, the curriculum is set by Education Scotland. It's the curriculum for excellence. And everything we do at its core has to reference these um, experiences and outcomes. Now, the curriculum for excellence is quite flexible. It does allow us to be fairly imaginative in combining it. Everything has to reference these. If you're working with schools, then we have to work with the, within the curriculum. We have to show that we are, are, are delivering this curriculum. Um, OK, Education Scotland is quite focused now on learning for sustainability. That means one of the most important bodies in Scottish education is now expecting an inspector will, uh, certainly when we were inspected before the holidays, um, we were, the, the inspectors were looking for us to understand sustainability within the school and looking for us to reference things like the, um, the global goals alongside the curriculum. Um, right, so when Island Centre for Net Zero came, I, we were delighted that um, Susan responded in the way that she did um, when we wrote our letters. From the point at which Susan and Florian came into the school to meet us and suggest things, there were many changes. It was a process. We got um, our funding, Susan got our funding for this project um, from the Highlands and Islands, climate change, something, something. Anyway, so the idea about that fund is that it matches researchers from academia um, 
with people who are working directly with the community. So to, you've seen Susan's clarity of vision, to bring that together with schools was very difficult. You had two different worlds of jargon, apart from anything. Um, and so when we say, you know, uh, yes, but that class is early level or that class is, um, we have additional support needs um, within that class. We have, all of these things, we, we, we had a huge amount of jargon, which we had to hammer out so that we had a way of mutual understanding going forward. So one of the things, many things changed. Um, my, evolve, my understanding of, of uh, transition engineering evolved very quickly. I would also suggest that Florian and Susan's understanding of working with primary age children um, similarly developed very quickly. Um, one of the things that, that really was preserved through this whole process was that if you, if you think about those phases that Susan and Florian outlined, where that framework where you are remembering how or you're recalling and describing a time when things were different, you examine how things are now and then you look into the future. Broadly, that was preserved. Next slide, please. Oh. Yeah, they did go. Yeah, we're, we've had two slideshows, but it's okay. Keep going. Right. These are our net zero heroes. Okay, so um, it is absolutely critical that um, schools are very complicated organizations. They are almost communities within themselves. And one of the most powerful ways of engaging with the community is, is to allow to ensure that there is a strong pupil voice. So we did have we we knew that we were going to form the um the um net zero heroes, but it also follows a model that is quite common in schools. Um it might be called pupil council or something like that. So for our net zero heroes we had um it was really primary three and up. We had two or three people from each class. We met together as and when we could. And the children, I don't know if you've ever worked with groups of children, but decision making when it's led by children develops in very unexpected, very exciting, very interesting, sometimes very frustrating, always inspiring ways. Um, it is always an education for the adults that do that with them. Next slide, please. Um, right, okay, so one of the first things that we had to do was engage that wider community. Now, bear in mind that this project was starting in on the back of COVID. So that assembly that we had was the first meeting of adults and children and teachers in a school building for two years. It was very scary because not I, I don't mean for infection reasons it's because covid really fragmented school communities so all the things that, that tie schools together the christmas fair the sports day all of those things that allows parents to see parents teachers to meet teachers meeting people uh, meeting parents picking up kids at the end of the day all of that had disappeared for two years and that was the first time that we were in the same room as each other it was an important moment in a lot of ways. Um, but that was our first, we had a very supportive, Stephen Johnson was the head of our school council. He was incredibly supportive. He absolutely understand what we were doing, uh, what this was about and what we wanted to do and what the children wanted to do. Um, children leading assemblies is also always very exciting and unnerving, but they did. One of the things they really liked doing is talking to the press. So. Um, we had no difficulty getting um, two or three of the pupils. In fact, most of the Net Zero heroes were incredibly articulate um, in, and, and free to the point when engaging with local press. Um, can you go on to the next slide, please? Right. Um, so we have now the start of the process. One of the things that we had to do, one of the... <laughs> One of the things which was a bit of a dirty drop for Florian and Susan was <clears throat> um, what children at the time that they, we first started this work really understood about key 
concepts, climate change, sustainability. Um, we tried our best as much as time would allow to test with the children as much as we could as we were going along. So we, we, I had a couple of times when I just I took pupils of different ages to ask them what they, I, they thought um, various keywords meant, had they heard them before. So one of the primary fours, one of the very smart primary fours, that sustainability was a sort of animal. Um, so we had work to do. One of the most important workshops that we did with all of the classes from primary three up is the one that you can see being led by Florian. That's what Florian looks like in real life. Um, Florian did this demonstration of global warming. Um, it, I think it had, if Florian's still there, he can correct me if I'm wrong. It involved um, bicarbonate of soda, involved um, uh, taking temperatures. Within the experiment that he did, he showed global warming. Um, global warming being created by emissions. Um, and at that moment, I can tell you it wasn't just the children who um, went, okay, right, I know, I, I see that. The other process that we were really trying to do is you can see that we had to, one of the ways that if, we, if when you're involved in that sort of process, you really have to go from where the children are. So part of that workshop was also them, them looking at photographs and deciding what was global warming and what, was, uh, what were the big issues and what weren't. Children get very hung up on litter. We do, we've been doing Bagger but the Brock have been doing a fantastic job in Orkney for a very long time. They work with schools for a lot of years and children think that children associate that as being the main priority for looking after our environment. So um, th there is a, a, a quite a big process to, to go through to deepen that understanding of staff and of children. It's the next slide. Um, here we have two of the workshops. Um, we have the pipe cleaner one, which was very good. We always love a big map. Everybody loves a big map. Who doesn't? Um, and that was the sweeties. We did get a bit distracted by the sweeties. I'm not going to lie. Um, there's apparently a really important concept I think we're not quite home and dry on, which is um, I had to look it up cap and share where you go. You've got this set number of journeys to school. Um, you're allowed to have so many per year. How are you going to share that out between the school community? We shared the suites. We're working on sharing the journeys and making that sort of conceptual leap from a very enjoyable workshop um, to what that means in practice and how we apply that to other situations. OK, next uh, slide. Uh, that's another one of that one. Thank you. Next slide. Right. Um, Right, what we've got onto here is we're a bit ahead of ourselves here, but one of the other things that we did was we had to meet it with curriculum. So two of the classes did a whole long-term project on sustainability, and that really allowed them to get to really deepen their understanding. They and it wasn't something that we would have done, but we were able to say, we were able to flag up at the end of one year, next year, when you come back to class teachers. Please, could you think about trying to do uh, a, a, an interdisciplinary topic which has some element of sustainability in it? And two of the classes really went for it. They did a fantastic job. OK, next slide. Uh, right. OK, so. One of the things that moves around school communities is, is, is making moments and making events. So when we were looking for, again, this is a way where ideas met with um, schools. Schools are terrible to work with, okay? They're, they're really awful, okay? So poor Florian, I have to apologize now to poor Florian, poor Susan. Every time they email, or every time they think that either staff will change or I'm in the middle of report writing and I don't get near anything bigger for three weeks and I don't reply and they say can we come into school and you say well only between on a Tuesday between 2 30 and then three o'clock and then they get a message and say actually I've got to cover somebody else's class no you can't come in so that we're a menace to work with but we are really necessary to work with because one of the things that school does is it reaches the whole community 
Okay, so we don't have to worry about only interested people. Our connect, we, we don't make connections with just people who've already got an electric car. We're not meeting people just from one part of the, um, with that one economic profile from a particular geographical location. You have every family you have the potential to reach every or nearly every family. Because even if you don't have a child at school, you might have a grandchild, you might have a neighbor, okay? So annoying as we are, we, we have got really good opportunities to do, to, to meet with and create story, create an event, create an identity with a community, with a wide group of people. So the, one of the ideas is that celebration at the end that Susan talked about, they were talking about having a party in the car park. Well, you do not want 200 children running around a car park at one time, even and especially with a barbecue, which was the other thing we nearly had. Mm -hmm. So we managed to hammer out an event, a happening, and this was courtesy of the Net Zero Heroes. I mean, it really was. They sat there and we said, oh, they, they just get cross. They get impatient with adults. They go, oh, just close the car park. So that's what we did. We closed the car park. It cost us 70 pounds um, for us to close the car park for one day. We thought parents would be quite cross about that. It's quite inconvenient. But we closed the car park. Um, the Net Zero Heroes went on Radio Orkney to talk about what we were doing. What are you going to do with the car park? We went back to that idea of uh, what would this piece of ground be used for? What would it be great to use this piece of ground for if we didn't have to cover it in tarmac and cars? And children got that straight away. So we spent a long time trialing different kinds of chalk paint. Um, next slide, see what's on there. Yep, that's that's the car park that we closed. We had to talk to everybody. We had to talk to Picky Centre. We had to talk to St Coombs. Everybody was up for it. It was all fine. Next slide, please. And there we go. So we <laughs> we, luck, we lucked out in the morning. All the younger classes got to go out and we each allocated part of the car park and we painted those designs that you saw earlier onto the car park. Um, they were very excited about painting the car park. Um, and we intend to close the car park and paint the car park again this year. But that created a moment for reflection. It created a shared memory for that whole school community even if we're just inconveniencing people by closing that car park, people remember that. So when I was talking to the children today and, and going through some of these slides and then remembering some of the things that we did last year, everybody remembered this bit. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and also they, they did get ice cream as well, but they remember the car park being closed as well. Um, next slide, okay. One of the other ways that we had to, I don't know if, if you've ever heard, there's this marvellous resource for schools called Philosophy for Children. Um, and this was part of this project, um, Stories for Change. We used the, I think we had four or five stories which originated from uh, Susan, which we then tested with the children, because what we were trying to do was deepen the children's understanding of aspects of climate change. So essentially some of them were kind of almost metaphors, but there were also stories about John Ray. Um, there was a story about using appropriate technology. And the idea is that you have a story, either the class teacher can read it, you have some key questions and you follow a philosophy for children structure, which allows them to engage with talking and listening around that subject. Um, so all of the families in Gleitness got copy of this book to use at home and teachers to use in the classroom. Right, so this is what we started with. This was, if our dining room wasn't shut because of some dodgy beans, you would be able to see this enormous um, artwork that was created by uh, the art teachers at Glenis. One of the other things about schools when they work together are wonderful places. Um, and the art teachers also instantly got it. We said we need something really big, we need something really impactful, and we would like it to centre on that phase three, um, that last phase of the project where you are imagining Kirkwall of the future. So that leap that Susan wanted the children to make um, 
we we chose to do that through a whole school art project i don't know how the art teachers did it but if you ever get a chance to come into Gleitness's dining room. It is a marvellous, marvellous piece of work. And it represents, and while that artwork was happening, the children were talking about Gleitness, uh, Kirkwall of the future. They were imagining it, they were envisaging it and um, prepping us for um, actions that we might have to, have to take um, in the future. Um, so, as part of the self-evaluation, um, we have now got, uh, we thought about some of the things. We, luckily, the money that we got from Highlands and Islands Climate Change, we'd phone them up and say, you know the thing that we put on the application form? We're not quite doing that. Is that okay? We are spending the money. And they were great. They said, it's all about process. And I said, we have got a ton of process going on. That's no problem. We can meet that criteria. We are extending the, the project courtesy of Florian and Susan once again. And I think that we have to do that year on year. Um, it doesn't necessarily involve Florian and Susan ongoing, but we're lucky enough to have that for a little bit longer. Um, but it must become part of our school identity. It must become part of how we are. Um, in Gleitness School. That's why we create that little subtitle, Getting to School the Gleitness Way, and that we start to take pride and knowledge and in the knowledge and understanding about why we are making a, a change. So we have a long way to go. Um, we have, um, uh, Florian has innovated ways about collecting the data so that the children get immediate feedback as to how they're doing about their journeys to school. Um, and we are also going to extend that conversation with the wider school community to try and embed it and create it as part of our identity. That's it. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. We've got a bit of time for um, a few questions, but I'm going to take a liberty while you're thinking of questions and the audience is to ask, um, pick up asking Peter, uh, Peter a question. So schools are a menace to, menace to, to work with. I'm my boss now. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I get the picture and the kind of pressures that teachers are under. Um, do you think this is something that we can, and you can see the enthusiasm with the kids, and I get that, um, that we can enthuse teachers about? And Well, it's been really interesting, um, the process, because if anybody's ever tried to run... Um, after school twilight training for teachers, you understand that when they sit down at half past three after they've had a day uh, a day at work and they're looking at you going, this better be good. Um, uh, one of the really important things that Florian and the other PhD students, which was really valuable to get the teachers on board is they came and did a staff meeting. Mm. So the workshops that they did, like the map and so forth, there's a lot of practical stuff that teachers need to be, if you're developing resources, there's a lot of practical stuff that you need to hammer out. Uh, so they came and uh, Florian talked about what they were doing. And then we tried out the game and we tried out the, the map and the pipe cleaners activity. And immediately they would say, well, you've got 30 children, you need to have more copies of the map, um, so on and so forth. And that informal conversation and trialing was pretty crucial. Um, I don't think we've got any choice really, mm -hmm. have we? But I think mm -hmm. that there have been moments where you get that look going, well, this better be good because I'm a really busy person. I'm tired. Um, you need four people within there who, who are up for this. You know, I don't think the children are alone in being anxious about climate change. I think we're increasingly, certainly when we went to the school council and the school council are quite often, you know, they've got important things to think about. Um, they've got long agendas and they're giving up their free time and they immediately got it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So we've got a question. If you could just let us know if it's for Kate or Susan or Florian who are online and uh, the appropriate person can jump mm -hmm. in. Well, it could be for any of them, so okay. I'll just ask the question and whoever thinks appropriate can answer it. Um, when you did the closing of the school car park, what measurements did you take to see how many school journeys were replaced by walking and how many just 
re -dis displaced the place that they dropped them off because I have a feeling that I had to almost park at the rugby club to go swimming that day. <laughs> oh, like, maybe no. Kate take that and then we can maybe ask yeah, for him. Um, we had one of the things that, that we hammered out throughout that process was the, the role of data. Um, because when the, the, we started initially talking about the project, there was a lot of discussion about data and how important it was. Now, schools collect, collect um, data about uh, that kind of thing um, quite regularly. Um, so what we chose to do, so the way that we could collect data wasn't going to meet academic. Florian, please jump in if I've not got this right. Um, but um it, it it wasn't going to meet a useful role for them in some respects but we still needed to measure have something to show roughly even what kind of impact so what we ended up doing is we just reproduced the hands up survey and we did that over that whole week um and it wasn't 80 percent it was down by about 20 percent Broadly, now we're, we haven't used that data because it doesn't meet the because it was literally going, you know, the net zero heroes went round each class and did a hands up survey. So, yeah, but that's that's a that's a useful start this year. Twenty percent this 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 last time you did it. So when you try it next time, if you repeat it and you've made thirty percent reduction, then that's showing progress. That's the way I would see it. Yes, it's horrible waiting for that, counting them up. <laughs> comparing the, the, the days. Um, I, I think what Florian's working on at the, at the moment and what we're hoping to do is to get that feedback loop of the data much cl much closer to the actual decision making, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. So, and again, it's a it's a test. We've not done it before, but the children are going to be adding with Florian's had been really thinking very hard about how children might ha immediately see change and we're going to we've talked about apps and you know doing versions of the walk mm. to school data um and we've actually ended up going for physical counters mm. um so that children and we're going to have regular assemblies where we're going to go okay you know this is where we are at the moment what do we need to do to get mm. this color so we, i think we're decided broadly We'll let you know in a year's time exactly what we do. We're, we're broadly, it's about, you know, we're trying to think about, because we, we started with the hands up definitions of different transports. I think in order to support the children's growing understanding of emissions and uh, transport journeys, we're going to have um, emission free and emission creating. Those are going to be the only two categories. So if you walk or you cycle, then that's a free pass to school um and then so so that's the balance that's the decision um that we're hoping to um can, can i ask maybe sorry ask uh, florian you there uh or, or susan mm -hmm. or if you'd want to say a word about you know about the kind of role of data i mean scientists are always wanting to gather data that's you know publishable and verifiable it's maybe not possible in a school setting always and it maybe doesn't meet the needs of the school and the children to to understand what's happening, but you know, I wonder if you had any comments on that. Right. Well, maybe to 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 um, put another answer on on the first question from from the audience. I think it was Martin. Um, well, yes, sure. It might have been just twenty percent. Um, as Susan said, the baseline was already quite 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 low, so, so that's really good. And what we also heard from from that whole walk to school week, as it was called, is that a lot of families actually tried really hard to not use the car and it might have been just a one off week but we had a, a lot of interesting conversations with people who well basically tr tried to walk their kids to school and they said that it was it was really good to get some fresh air in the morning some exercise before they got to work to kind of wake them up instead of having a cup of coffee another family um, actually hired an electric cargo bike to do their their errands and the school runs so, so all of that was really interesting and we had people who, who tried to make the change so so that's i guess promising on the one hand side and then coming back to sandy's question the data part is definitely important on the one hand side to to validate your results as a researcher but to also validate your say net zero status as a school and um right as kate said we're, we're working on this it's it's kind of 
um, hardware analog at the moment, but uh, we're getting there with data tools in, in the in the current round of, of new funding. And yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got a question on the mic from Simon. Thank you. Um, it's a question for everybody, I guess. Um, it's really cool to hear about what's been going on. It sounds like you've done some amazing things with school um, and with the kids. And it sounds like that might actually be making a difference slowly in terms of how people travel. Um, what are the odds of actually getting to do cap and trade? Uh, both through well, what are the barriers and would the parents actually buy into it? And what are the chances you actually get to try it out? Yeah, I'll maybe um, I'll maybe ask Kate first, and then we we'll then we can go to Susan after Kate's had a because we haven't talked about parents yet here, mm -hmm. and um, you know they're the ones with the cars. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, indeed. So maybe if you've got a response, uh, I'll um, ask Susan. There's an off. I think we need to develop the children's understanding. We need to go back to that workshop, which actually did do a really good job of thinking about the concept. Um, we need to deepen that understanding beyond the children to the parents. And um, Florian's got ideas about how to do that as well. Um, to have it almost like a physical trading game. Fundamentally, we can't and, you know, our, our job is people turn up at the door and we do educating. Um, so it is, a, it is a relationship change. Uh, we, have, we have no capacity to say, well, you're not getting in if you arrive. Do you know the youth? You weren't allowed, you weren't yeah, allowed to you drove there, uh, yeah. uh, arrive to youth hostel in a car. Um, yeah. So perhaps we would need the support, I think, of, of central government. <laughs> if we were to say you're not allowed to drive, arrive at school by anything other than horse or foot. Well, the, the research shows that if it's physically possible, um, to make the journey by walking, cycling, or or pushing us, you know, doing a scooter or something, that the biggest barrier to that is that you haven't tried to do it. And so this is all about the 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 impetus to try coming from the children undertaking this exploration exercise, thinking of it as a as an explorer's journey to. Um, you know, to map out that route and then to make the trip maybe with their caregiver or something so that everyone understands what that journey is like and that they actually can do it. So that we'll get we'll get an awful lot of the way just from that trying. Um, the interactions I had with the children is that they seemed very happy to get that opportunity to have their school run um, and not be dropped off. So so they're hardy, they're um, you know, they're they're ready to go and they have a good time riding their bike and their scooter. Um, the other thing I did want to make sure is that we acknowledge um, Jack um, Bolton, who is another PhD student who you saw. In, he was the 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 fellow with the mustache <laughs> there with the students and Imogene Kerr, who helped a lot by helping us think about what how do children perceive when we're talking about climate change or um, you know, something um, being a thing we have to change. What, 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 how do they perceive that? And, and you know, is it different from children? And and how is this climate change thing affecting children's psychology and their psyche anyway? Um, and yes, of course, the 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 what. Uh, well, it, it's part of the transition lab that we know that it's a stakeholder journey. That's part of the the theory and part of the, the research, um, but to experience it firsthand with something that's so far out of our normal. Uh, I have had two elementary children, but it was 30 years ago. <laughs> so um, that, you know, like you say, that whole atmosphere is something we all um, maybe don't don't know that much about and, and don't experience. So we, we couldn't have um, really had that um, work at all if we didn't have uh, the participation of Kate and the children and the other teachers and especially um, Ms. Rendell, the the principal, um, being so open to the school taking this this journey. 
Okay, thank you. Does any have got any other questions from the audience? Um, I'm kind of conscious that we've 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 kind of used our, our allocated time with the um, technical challenges at the start. I don't know if there was any que questions coming in. There's some chat going on. Yeah, there's some chat, which is, is yeah, it's good. But if there aren't any specific questions, so Susan does just one seven minutes. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so last chance. So we don't have any other questions. I'd just like to, well, first of all, just sort of reiterate that point. I mean, it's, I think the conversation illustrates that there are many kind of layers and complexities around this behavioral change that has got to take place. Um, there is not just a technical, technical fix to climate change and net zero. And like Susan says, technical fixes are just gonna slow the problem down a bit. We need to do that. But we need behavioural change, and I, I can't reiterate how, you know, as academics, it's the sort of thing we think about. But it wasn't us that approached the school; it was this sort of desire in the school and the desire in the children to actually do something sort of positive. And you know that is is truly remarkable. And you know, if I've got to say thanks to anybody, it's the school and Kate for actually sort of coming forward and being prepared to kind of embrace change and look at it and look at the challenges and difficulty of that. So um, so just before we all finish, I'd just like to give you know, a, a sort of quick round of applause to the speakers and especially Kate and Glenn is being at school and the children who aren't here. <laughs> so thanks to them. Thank you.